Not long, my brothers. Soon, I shall have the missing pages. I can begin your true resurrection. In the vast deserts of Mehekara, under the scorching gaze of the sun, the vampire counts face the tomb kings in a massive battle of attrition and magic. The warrior queen, Kalita, would have to fight with all her might if she is to withstand the dark powers that approach. In this episode, legions of undead will fight each other for control of one of the nine books of Nagash, an incredibly powerful resource that contains priceless knowledge of dark magic. All bow before High Queen Kalida, the embodiment of the Asp. She has been sent far from Lybarus by her beloved goddess. Kalida, the warrior queen of the city of Lybarus, was highly respected across all the lands of Nehekara. Her intelligence and bravery were as legendary as her intense sense of honor and justice. Kalida was killed by her cousin, Neferata, Queen of Laumia, during a duel that saw both queens fighting during a celebratory feast. Neferata desired the death of Kalida, for the warrior queen had been growing suspicious of her cousin. Kalida was right to be wary, for Neferata had attempted to recreate the elixir of life, and in doing so had become the first of the vampires. If Kalida was not silenced, then the Lamian's dark secrets would be discovered. So it was that Neferata falsely accused Kalida for treason, and the warrior queen rose to personally defend her honor. The two women fought before the shocked nobility, their blades weaving a delicate and deadly dance. Kalida was a skilled warrior, yet she could not match Neferata's supernatural speed or unholy strength, and was struck with a mortal blow. As Kalida lay dying, Neferata bit hard on her own tongue and placed her mouth over the lips of her cousin, letting vampiric blood flow down the warrior queen's throat. As the life began to leave her body, Kalida knew that cursed blood now flowed through her veins. In desperation, she cried out to the gods to save her from the same fate that had taken hold of Neferata. Asaph, the Asp Goddess, heard her pleas and purified the vampiric taint from Kalida's veins. She was then embalmed and placed in a seated position within a reliquary. And there she sits, unmoving, her face concealed behind a beautiful death mask created in her likeness. Artem Klugman was a necromancer whose humanity had been mostly consumed, exchanged for the ability to channel the dark magic needed to raise the dead and bend their will. The necromancer was on a quest to find one of the nine books of Nagash. The tome was said to contain hidden enchantments and ancient words of power, an invaluable item that needed to be retrieved if he truly wanted to establish his dominance and influence amongst the other vampire lords. So it was that Artem was drawn to the desert lands of Nehekara. An army of grotesquely reanimated corpses and skeletal warriors were brought to life, if it can even be called that. They were now the necromancer's servants, and would help him on his mission to gain the forbidden knowledge. The Blood Knights were one of the most powerful allies that accompanied Artem. These vampires ride evil nightmares that are clad in thick barding and their armor and fell weapons inscribed with dark runes and images of death. Their martial prowess is incomparable. They are known to be the most fearsome cavalry in all of the Old World. Even the well-respected Grail Knights of Bretonia cannot match them. Their vampiric curse giving them unnatural speed and strength, enhancing even more the training and strict discipline they have in life. 
Under his command also advanced a mortis engine, a powerful cage made of fused bones that carries deadly artifacts that steals energy from the enemy and energizes the undead nearby. Tomb banshees and spirits constantly howl in the air around it in dark magic pulses heavily within the mortis engine. Sensing the rising threat, Queen Kalita, ruler of Labaris, had already awoken her armies. Through ancient incantations and rituals, the dead were possessed with new vitality. The Tomb Guard was ready to fight for their High Queen once again. Even after death, they would not leave their service. They bore heavy shields and golden masks. Along the skeletal legion stride statues awakened by powerful incantations. Constructs whose stone eyes never blink. A massive bone giant rose above the entire army, walking and making the earth shake with each heavy step. Its hulking presence alone would be enough to send any sane man running the other way. But on the other side of the battlefield, there was an army of undead, immune to human emotions like fear or terror. I'll have that casket and the pages within. Standing as imposing monuments carved into the likeness of the gods and goddesses of Nehekara, the Ushabti are animated by complex rituals and possessed by the souls of Nehekara's mightiest heroes. They carry ritualistic weapons so heavy that it will require the combined strength of three men just to be able to lift them. It was in the arid deserts of the Land of the Dead that both armies clashed. The air was blowing heavy with dark magic, and indistinguishable voices and whispers coursed through the desert. The silent march of both armies heralded the terrible battle that was to come. The perfectly ordered formations of the Tomb Kings advanced under the baking sun. They all obeyed Kalita's command without question or hesitation. The same happened on the other side of the field, where countless undead were advancing under the will of the powerful necromancer. Groups of scavenger birds flew over the sun-drenched battlefield. On the Vampire Count's right flank, Black Knights, followed closely by two deadly units of Blood Knights, covered Growl quickly, closing the distance in an early attack upon the Tomb King's formation. A unit of massive Vargeists also joined them, flying high above and ready to dive into the enemy with crimson fangs and sharp claws. The Blood Knights charged a unit of Ushabti without hesitation, their lances crashing straight against the tall and deadly figures. They caused great damage with their devastating charge and were initially winning the engagement against the towering god statues. But the Tomb Kings were quick to respond. With a spell, the Blood Knights and the remaining cavalry were immobilized and quickly engaged by the nearby legions of the Tomb Kings, who were better equipped to deal with the deadly vampiric cavalry. Despite this drawback, the Blood Knights were more than a match to the spears of Mehekara and kept causing destruction and havoc on the Tomb King's flank. On the center of the battlefield, the lines were closing as massive skulls arched the skies launched from giant catapults made of twisted bones. The volleys of flaming skulls screamed as they hurled through the air. It is said that those awful sounds are the very same screams of the skulls' former owners and the agonizing cries of the Tomb King's prisoners. 
Each impact, unleashing all the curses that the Lich Priests had bestowed upon the skulls. The massive bone giant also released deadly projectiles from its enormous bow. Each arrow thick enough to cause serious damage to whatever the bone giant aimed. The vampire counts advanced without stopping, not caring for any losses. It was a massive horde of bone and flesh advancing relentlessly against the full might of the Nehekaran legions. Now, go my minions, onwards! Drawn by the dark magic that surrounded the Necromancer and its army, swarms of crypt ghouls advanced through the sands with only rags and crude weapons. Accompanying them were the malformed monstrosities known as Crypt Horrors, evidence of the terrible depths that their master has sunk to in his quest for survival. It is said that to create a Crypt Horror, a vampire must allow a ghoul to gulp down on his precious blood. Once a Crypt Ghoul has drunk the blood of a vampire, its eyes turn red, going into a killing frenzy, and with time, they grow several times in ferocity and size. Neither side issued a war cry as the lines crashed. Instead, the crunching sound of hundreds of warriors came to being. The breaking of bones and the clack of weapons and armor to be heard all across the battlefield. Both armies clashed at each other with impressive fury as neither side felt things such as fear or hesitation. combat was grueling. Undead warriors hacked against each other, breaking bones and splintering ribs. When a skeleton warrior fell, another would immediately step up to take its place and continue fighting. This was no ordinary battle. There were no barking orders or screams, only the crude sound of steel against bone and stone against putrid flesh. The sound of death. The battle came to a grind as the Vampire Count's army raised more dead to battle against their enemies, while the Tomb Kings reanimated their fallen warriors from the sand to fight once again. The air was heavy with magic as spells were cast and manifested in many forms across the battlefield. Vampire thralls of my worst cousin have blighted Nahekara. Today we burn out that blight. Hear me, O oh Asaf! This slaughter I offer in your name. May your venom flow in the sacred staff 
that I may shatter your adversaries for all eternity. The massive catapults were still firing into the vampire lines and causing heavy casualties. Artem unleashed a devastating spell on the deep lines of Tomb Kings, rendering one of their screaming catapults almost unusable. Dire wolves charged straight into the remaining skeletons in the catapults in an attempt to finish them off. In the thick of the fight, a full unit of Ushabti emerged from the sands right behind a mass of skeletons and the Grave Guard unit that were fighting the Tomb King's constructs. They immediately charged and began unleashing total destruction upon their foes. Every sweeping arc of their heavy blades, sending waves of broken pieces of bone and shattered steel. The battle raged on for hours, and the Blood Knights continued to fight, their armor impervious to the foe's weapons. They charged through ranks of skeletons and against the animated constructs of stone. But as more and more skeletons were being reanimated again and again, the number of Blood Knights began to dwindle, and their threat on the battlefield began to fade accordingly. The onslaught continued without pause, with both armies replenishing their forces with a constant use of magic. Over the time that had passed since the battle started, both parties had attempted to eliminate the other necromancers and priests to deny their enemies the use of spells. And it had worked with relative success. Both armies had suffered losses to their casting abilities, but no decisive blow had been made. The Vampire Counts had carved a deep hole in the Tomb King's lines, but the skeletons were brought down just to be reanimated to fight once again. At this point, usually without an arm, a leg, or even without a skull. In this battle of attrition, the winner would be the one who could reanimate their losses faster than the enemy. In this case, the Tomb Kings were slightly ahead. The vampires would replenish a crumbling battle line, only for another one to collapse. Slowly but surely, the Tomb Kings were beginning to consolidate their position on the battlefield.
With both armies depleted and crumbling beneath the glare of the blazing sun, the necromancer knew that only by slaying the warrior queen Kalida would the Tomb Kings finally collapse. So he set about to personally kill her. Kalida engaged in close combat with the Necromancer, both exchanging blows and using all the remaining magic available to them. The duel was intense, but short. With a devastating attack from the Venom Staff, Kalida struck down Artem. The Staff, moving as if alive, killed the Necromancer with all the spite of a Saf herself. With their master dead, the remaining vampires and skeleton warriors crumbled the dust. Only the massive Vargeists remained and lived to fight for their survival. The beasts splintered shields with their claws, but their monstrous strength was not enough and soon they too fell to the hot sands. Only when all her enemies were dead, and a grim silence fell over the battlefield, did she command her legions back to Libaris to sit once again on her throne. After the battle, Thousands of bones and weapons could be seen all across the battlefield. It wouldn't be too long before the baking sands of the desert swallowed them whole. On this channel, we are putting together narrative Total War cinematic battles and Warhammer lore videos. A special thank you goes to our Patreon supporters who help us in the making of more content. You can also directly support the channel through Patreon, find the link in the description below. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification button to be the first to watch the next video. Thank you for watching and see you on the next one.